One of the biggest questions that we wrestle with as humans is these questions surrounding good and evil. I mean, from the time that we're little, we're hearing stories about uh, knights and dragons, good guys and bad guys. From, From very early on in our lives, the big questions we ask are questions of good and evil, and will good defeat evil, and, and, and things surrounding that nature. And something that we discover as we dig into scripture, as we look at the, the grand story that God is writing, is that that is very much at the center of many of the struggles we have on a day-to-day basis. Is this thing really good? Is this thing really bad? Why is evil reigning in the world? Why isn't good more prevalent? These are all questions that we struggle with, that we wrestle with as part of being humans. And over the last several weeks, we've been following this guy named Jonah on his journey of some crazy things that have been happening. And he's asked some big questions embedded within his story. And as we finish up today in Jonah chapter 4, we get at the very heart of some of these core questions that we have as humans, these questions of good, these questions of evil. And at the heart of it, we ask the question, is God really good? Maybe that's a different picture than what you had growing up. Maybe you grew up and God was good, God was great, God was friendly. Maybe you also grew up and God was angry all the time. That's kind of the picture you maybe had of God. As we get into Jonah chapter 4, we wrestle with this idea of, God, are you really good? I want you to be good. Are you really good? And also as we get into chapter 4, we wrestle with these idea of how much evil really lurks within my own human heart. Those are a couple questions that we're going to wrestle with today, and wherever you're at today, whether you're a Christian, whether you're not, this has a lot to tell us about God's character. It has a lot to tell us about our tendencies. It has a lot to tell us about the human condition, and some of these big existential questions that we ask, no matter where you are at at the spectrum. So I invite you to grab your Bible, grab a cup of coffee, whatever you're doing today, as we dig into Jonah chapter 4 and wrestle with this question, God, are you really good? So as we get into Jonah chapter 4, here's kind of what's happened. Jonah's been on a crazy journey so far. God told him to go and do this thing. He did not do the thing. Uh, Through a crazy turn of events, he ended up getting back on track and did what God asked him to do. But he didn't do it God's way. Jonah was called to go and uh, preach to this town in Nineveh. And so in chapter 3, Jonah gave the worst sermon in the whole Bible. And amazingly, in spite of that, God still used his message to turn the people around. So they said, you know what? We ain't going to live that old life of evil. We're going to turn around and do things God's way. Uh, The other thing that it kind of told us last week is that God wants us all to turn from brokenness to experience his love. That's part of what is at God's heart. And as we get into chapter four today, we experience Jonah's response to the fact that God turned his anger away from Nineveh and gave them compassion and grace rather than destruction. So if you have your Bibles today, if you're following along, we'll have it on the screen as well. We're going to start in Jonah chapter 4, verse 1, and it starts like this. God turns away from his anger. He does not bring destruction to Nineveh. And Jonah says, but Jonah, to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. So get this, Jonah preaches a, a, a terrible sermon to these people that God wanted him to to. God wants to save these people. And as a response, God in his mercy, in his grace, in his compassion, saves the Ninevites. And at this, Jonah thinks it's very wrong. In Hebrew, this word is evil. To Jonah, this seemed evil that God would save people. Is that kind of whacked? Doesn't that seem kind of weird? But if we're honest, if you and me are honest, how many times have we thought that? There's that friend who doesn't really study for the tests, yet he always gets a better grade for, than you do. <sighs> kind of seems not right, right? You know, or maybe someone that you know, maybe a family member, just someone in your circle, you know, they, they don't make the best decisions, yet it seems that good things happen to them sometimes when bad things happen to you for doing the good thing. Those are things that we struggle with. And the Bible notes sometimes, uh, like in Ecclesiastes, that it rains on the just and the unjust is what it says. That there's this idea that there is brokenness in the world and that um, broken things happen to people who do good and people who do 
evil as well. And in the same turn, sometimes good things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people too. And what's interesting here is that the, the whole reason why Nineveh was saved is because they turned to God and in his grace, he saved them. That's the beautiful thing is that in your story, in my story, no matter where we are at, God wants us to turn to him and God wants to shower us in his grace. Sometimes we still have to deal with the consequences of poor decisions that we've made, but ultimately we are saved in God. That is how grace works. Grace ain't something you done to earn. It's not something that I could do to earn. Grace is something that God gives us freely through his son, Jesus Christ, who lived the life we should have, died the death that we deserved and rose again and invites us into it. And the reality is, whether you've been a Christian your whole life, whether you say yes to Jesus on your deathbed, that grace is available to you, no matter what your life story looks like. That is how the economy of grace works. It doesn't always make sense, but it is something far more beautiful than we could have ever dreamed up on our own. And Jonah doesn't really like this. Jonah doesn't really like the fact that he wants these Ninevites, the greatest political rivals they had at the time, people who were brutal, he doesn't like the fact that they turned to God and God accepted their turn, accepted their their turning back to him. And at this, he became angry. And in Hebrew, when you see the word angry, it's this very like, um, it's like a word that means like heat. It's almost like this, this seething. Like if you've ever been furious, you know, you kind of feel your blood boiling and the heat rising in your body. That's kind of the word picture we get. Jonah thinks that what God has done is evil. And he's become very angry at it from the very first sentence of chapter four. Jonah is wrestling with this question, God, are you really good? And then he goes on in verse two and he says, so Jonah prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, while I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. That is one of the weirdest complaints to God I've ever heard. I knew that that's how you were. You were compassionate. That's the kind of tone Jonah is using here. And look at what he says. Isn't this what I said, Lord, while I was still at home? We see that this crazy journey that Jonah has been on, this struggle he's been through with God, it's not something that just happened. That this entire time throughout the book, maybe Jonah's even entire life, He's having a hard time grappling with the character of God. But it's not because he's lightning bolt God. It's because he is loving God. And Jonah has a hard time reconciling this. That he serves a God who is willing to give grace when there is offense. That he is a God who is willing to give mercy when we deserve death. That is the kind of God of the Bible. That is the God that is represented here in Jonah. But that is not a God that Jonah is okay with. Because in reality, Jonah doesn't want to serve God as he is. He wants to serve a God of his own making. A God that is more about the nation than he is people. That's what Jonah wants because Jonah's a huge national guy. A God who destroys Israel's enemies but keeps Israel safe. A God who fits into Jonah's box. But that's not the God that Jonah serves. And you know, that's so often what we do. We want to serve a God of our own making, but the God we try to make usually isn't God as he represents himself. We do not have the right or the say to tell God who he should be. He created everything. He is the master of all. He loves you so much that he knows you by name, every hair on your head. He intends good things for you. We, like Jonah, so often try to form him into a God of our own making, and we put things on God that really have nothing to do with God. And when we do that, and God acts in a way we don't think he should, we end up like Jonah, griping at him for being gracious, mad at him for being compassionate, furious at him for being slow to anger and abounding in love. 
This God who is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love, the one who relents from sending calamity to those who turn to him, he is a God who loves you and I so much that even when we, like Jonah, are questioning and and throwing these things at him and trying to uh, frame him in a way different than who he is, he still loves us. He's still gracious. Just because we want to put God in a box that he might not be doesn't mean he stops being gracious or compassionate or slow to anger. And the beautiful thing is even when we wrestle with his goodness, even when we wrestle with his character, he still loves us enough to work with us in compassion and in grace, which is what we're going to see here that he does with Jonah after Jonah makes one more really nutso statement. So after Jonah chews God out for being compassionate and good, he says this in verse 3. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. You didn't nuke Nineveh, so just kill me now, is what Jonah is saying here. Isn't that extreme? Isn't that a little moody? Can't he just write some poetry and get it, like, chill out a little bit? Jonah is so furious that God did not kill Israel's greatest political rivals at that time. He's just ready to die. That's not the first time that Jonah has said that in this book. Back in chapter 1, he was ready to die by getting thrown into the sea rather than even talk to God. And now that things didn't work out the way he wanted to, he's ready to be done. Take a note of that because he's going to say that several more times before this chapter is done. And uh, when words repeat in the Bible, that's something that we kind of got to pay attention to. But here's the thing. I am grateful that Jonah says this because how many times have we been there? How many times have we been in life, uh, things haven't gone the way that we wanted to, maybe we've been so ticked at God that we just said, you know what, it'd just be better if it was done. It'd be better if I just um, was finished right now, you know. I'm tired of living this way. I'm tired of struggling through. The thing I love about the Bible is it addresses reality in its rawest forms. And uh, this is a pretty raw statement, right? Lord, take away my life for it's better for me to die than to live. But one of the main messages here in Jonah is it's never too late for God to do something through you. And even though Jonah has completed his mission to Nineveh, even though though Jonah is Mr. Gripe City here in chapter 4, God still has purposes for him. God still wants Jonah to find his core identity, not in his own pride, not in his national pride, but God wants Jonah to find his identity in him, the God of compassion, the God of love. And God still has purposes for him. He ain't done with Jonah yet. And Jonah's attitude is keeping him from really getting to a spot where he can open himself up to the purposes of God. One thing that Jonah, God desperately wants Jonah to know is that I still have purposes for you. I still have plans for you. I still want to use you. And wherever you are today, that's what God's call is for you too. Maybe you are like Jonah where you are just mad at God and like this and you're sick of it. What we're going to see in chapter 4 is God still wants to use you and have a relationship with you. Maybe you're trying as best as you can and the struggles you're going through is just life circumstances stacked up against you. God still wants to use you and still has a purpose for you. The Bible is quite clear. You don't get a suffer-free life. We're not going to just tell you that it's all daisies and rainbows once you say yes to Jesus. But following Jesus and having uh, him him fuel your your purpose, him give you identity, him save your life, that is something that will radically transform your life for the better. Doesn't just magically make life okay, but it does mean you don't have to go through life alone. And Jonah here, unfortunately, kind of wants to go through it alone because he doesn't really like who he thinks God is. And because of that, he's just ready to be done. But then God enters the scene in verse four and he says, but the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? As if to say to Jonah, what right do you have to be angry that I saved these people? Is it ultimately up to you whether people are saved or not saved? Were you there at the foundations of the world when they were created? Are you governing over every minute thing that is happening in the world? Is it right for you to be angry? And when I read this, I don't 
hear God's tone as angry. I hear God's tone as compassionate, as loving, as desperately wanting Jonah to turn around and get on board with God's way of doing things. Because God wants to do things in such a way where he is saving people and bringing them to himself. Jonah just wants to watch people burn at this point, quite honestly. So the Lord asks him, is it right for you to be angry? That Jonah, even though he's angry, even though he's ready to die, even though he has nothing to do with God, God still reaches out. God still creates the conversation. God still wants to chat with him. God still wants to talk to him, even when he's in a very low, angry, bad place. And then in chapter five, it says that Jonah had gone out and he sat at a place down east of the city. And there he made himself a shelter, sat in the shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. In the same way that God turned, Jonah was hoping God would turn back and still fireball the city. And so he just sets up a little camp. I mean, to put this in our modern day thing, it'd kind of be like if we just got our lawn chairs and we just kind of put them out on the hill and was just ready for God to toast them. That's what Jonah is doing. And I think it's so interesting that it says, there he made himself a shelter, as if to say, I want this to happen, I want these people to be toast, and I'm willing to to set up camp and wait as long as I need to for this thing to go my way. (laughs) And uh, the truth is we set up shelters all the time for that stuff. We kind of sit down for the long haul sometimes when things don't go our way, but we think that they should. And sometimes if we have a posture like this to God, we just set up our shelter and we wait for God to come around our way of thinking, We are not opening up our hearts and our minds to the purposes God has for us to bring his goodness and compassion and grace to the world that looms at the depth of our hearts as humans. It's so easy for us to cross our arms and turn our back from God when God is beckoning and calling to us. Jonah himself serves at a bit of a warning to us of how messy we can be as God's people. And we need to remember that rather than setting up camp in a resist God mode, we should instead invite God into our hearts, invite God into our camp, so to speak, so that he can begin doing a work in our hearts. Then it says in verse six, then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and he made it to grow up over Jonah to give him shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very, very happy about the plant. Isn't that cool? And take note of how it says God provided. When did that happen before? God provided before in chapter two when he provided a fish to swallow up Jonah and keep Jonah protected even though Jonah was in the heart of the sea. And even though Jonah's at a place where he probably shouldn't be in the hot sun griping and complaining, God still provides a leafy plant. Isn't that interesting that Jonah complains at God for being compassionate and gracious to the Ninevites? Yet, he's feeling nice and happy about how the gracious and compassionate God provides cover, undeserved cover, for Jonah to ease his discomfort. Now, I don't know about you, but if Jonah had been talking to me the way he talked to God, I ain't making him no plant. I ain't talking to him in a nice, gentle tone of voice. I'm going to be ticked at that guy. But God is full of compassion and grace for his people and for others. We see that as he gives compassion to Nineveh. We also see that as he gives compassion to his rogue prophet. God is full of compassion for all people. We need to not be so self-involved that we think that he isn't going to give it to the people who are doing messy things. We also don't need to be um, so, so self-deprecatory that we don't think that God is going to give his grace and his compassion to us as well. So Jonah on the hill waiting for Nineveh to go down then he gets the little plant and he's feeling kind of happy about life. Man the only thing that could make this better than a plant is fireballs. You know that's probably what he's thinking at that point. But then the story takes another interesting turn and Jonah the angry prophet kind of has his rock bottom moment part two. Let's continue on in verse seven. In verse seven, it says, but at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. Then in verse eight, it says, when the sun rose, God provided a scorching wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. We're going to pause right there for just a sec. God provided the plant 
God provided the fish. Then God provides a worm to eat the plant, and God provides a scorching east wind. This is what I love about God. You can't ever quite predict him. And for some of us, we hate that, but that's the whole thing about him being God and we're not. And Jonah, unfortunately, he wants to run his life. He wants to be God of his own life. And so this kind of stuff don't set well with him. And sometimes it doesn't set well with you or me either. You know, sometimes bad things happen as a result of being in a broken world. Sometimes different things happen in our lives. God brings about certain things to get our attention. That's what he's done with Jonah again and again and again. And there is this concept to God that we need to understand. As the Bible says, it says, you know, God gives and God takes away. That God in his sovereignty, that's kind of a big churchy word we use to say that God is in control of all. God in his sovereignty knows what is going to lead us toward what needs to be done. God cares about your ultimate joy. God does want you to be uh, full of joy and in a, in a place one day where you are um, delighting in him, when you are experiencing joy and happiness in him. But the point of life is not just to be happy all the time. Joy is an important part of following Jesus. It is at the core of what it means to be a Jesus follower. But life is not just this, this journey we're on to be happy all the time. God is more concerned with developing you than he is giving you a a lollipop even though your life is in flames around you, right? God doesn't want to just, you know, give you moments of happiness and keep you a terrible person. He wants to develop you. He's called you to be a part of his family from wherever you're at. He wants to develop you. He wants to, to create you to be the person he has intended you to be for your ultimate good. And sometimes God doing things for our ultimate good is uncomfortable. It was comfy with the plant, but it ain't very comfortable with the worm and the scorching wind. But God is providing that and using that to bring about a character change in Jonah to make Jonah the person who he wants him to be, to to set Jonah up for his ultimate good. God is trying to get Jonah's attention, so he needs to listen. And maybe that's the message you need to hear today. Maybe God is trying to get your attention, but your posture is kind of like this. And if your posture is like that, it's we're not opening ourselves up to listen to God. Doesn't mean we won't wrestle, doesn't mean we won't have things that we struggle through, but God wants you to take his struggles to him rather than for you to cross your arms and turn your back to him. Because if you bring your doubts and your questions and your worries and your concerns to God himself, first of all, what's the worst that could happen? I mean, if you're mad at God and you talk to God about it, like, I, I don't know, like what's the worst that could happen? Maybe he, he gives you some insight, you know, maybe, maybe you're not quite sure what's going on, but, but you have at least turned to the creator of the universe who wants to at least be present with you in your doubt and your questioning. If we have that kind of a posture, then we're setting ourselves up to doubt forward, to question forward, to still um, seek God to try to find out how he wants us to become the people he has meant us to be, even when we struggle. And so as these things happen, Jonah is presented with an opportunity to finally turn and talk to God, which he has not done throughout this entire book. He hadn't been talking to God very much. God's giving him an invitation to talk to him, and Jonah's still not having it. So he says, after uh, the blazing blazing heat came on Jonah's head and he grew grew faint, it says he wanted to die. And he said, it would be better for me to die than to live. He's at it again, the moody prophet is at it again God's trying to get his attention and he's just ticked and then in verse 9 God says it says but God said to Jonah is it right for you to be angry with me about the plant second time is it right for you to be angry Jonah is just ticked and God again and again and again is trying to get his attention And Jonah responds to God, it is, he said, and I'm so angry that I wish I were dead. Have you ever been that angry? Have you ever been that angry that it is sucking the very life force out of you? Here's the deal with anger. Anger ain't necessarily a bad thing, right? Sometimes anger is an indicator 
But the, the question is, do we listen to our anger or do we just let it run our lives? Because if you just let anger run your life without actually asking questions about it, you're going to be like Jonah and you're just going to be ticked off at everybody all the time. And can I give you a little piece of advice? If you're ticked off at everybody all the time, nobody wants to hang out with you. None of us want to hang out with the angry person. It's just not very enjoyable with the person who's angry and furious all the time. I mean, there are times in the Bible where we see anger is a good thing, where there's this righteous anger when we get upset with injustices in the world. But just to be angry all the time and never actually ask the question of why am I angry to do that detective work, we're setting ourselves up for failure. Because there's something driving Jonah's anger here. And we know from his character in the rest of the book that it's that God isn't doing things his way. It's that um, he's kind of selfish. It's that he's kind of prideful. And when things don't go his way, he gets ticked. Now, if we identify that in our own lives, it's an opportunity for us to surrender it to God. Say, you know what, God? I'm really angry right now. Why is that? Help me to identify that. Then as we kind of do the work, we can say, you know what? God, it's kind of out of line for me to be angry uh, that I didn't, um, that things didn't go just the way I wanted it to. Um, you know, help me to have enough humility to, to, to say that I don't always know the right way to do things, that I may not necessarily know uh, what is the best thing to do, but God, I'm trusting in you. This is an opportunity for Jonah to connect back with God, but instead he just keeps on doing the same song and dance. I'm sick of you. I want to be dead. I'm sick of you. I want to be dead. And he's ticked off at the fact that the plant that God provided has been taken away. And then in verse 10, God says this interesting thing. It says, but the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. God's pointing to this fact of Jonah, you so full of yourself, but who's the very one who keeps the cosmos in, in moving? Who's the very one who brought about the plant? Who is the one who has cared for it? Who is the one who has tended for it? It ain't you, Jonah. You think the entire world offers, you know, lives to offer you something, but in reality, there's so much about this world. There's so much about what gets done that is part of just the grace of God. When the rain comes and gives life to our, wa our, our grass and our trees and our soil, that is a gift from God. When we have a bright sunny day and get some vitamin D in our skin and in our bones, that is a gift from God. There is this thing that a theologians call common grace. Things that God does in maintaining his world and with other people where he shows them his goodness and his grace by, by just blessing them because of his goodness. That's what the deal was with the plant. And as Jonah's getting a little full of himself, God is reminding him, Jonah, you didn't do the plant thing. I did it because I love you. And because I'm God, I can give and I can take away. And part of the reason I take away is because I know what is best for you. I want to develop you. And unfortunately, you ain't changing under the shade. Sometimes the shade has to be taken away for you and for me to really listen to the voice of God to be developed into the people he's called us to be. And when that happens, we have the option to be ticked like Jonah or we have the option to listen and have our actions follow our suit. The interesting thing about Jonah is everybody up to this point hears the word of God, says that they're going to change and their actions follow. Jonah doesn't do that in this book. He hears from the word of God, sometimes he responds, and his actions never line up with his speech. A warning for you and for me as people who are Jesus people, that we need to live lives of integrity where our actions and our words match up. Jonah, in a lot of ways, shows us how far we can fall as the people of God but it also is a testament to God's compassion and goodness and that he's always calling us back. So God says this to Jonah and then it concludes in verse 11 when God says, and should I have not been concerned for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals. That's the last word in Jonah. Also many animals. Isn't that weird? 
I think this last verse is so important, though, because it kind of turns it all together. Jonah is asking this question, God, are you really good? And what we're finding out is that ultimately God is good, but he's different than how Jonah thinks he should be. God is good, but he doesn't fit into the God box that Jonah has. And God here gets at a really interesting point that Jonah is being so self-focused that he is more concerned with a plant over his head than he is hundreds of thousands of people in that city being brought to Jesus. And you know what? We're so guilty of that sometimes. We're concerned about our comfort. We're concerned about any number of things when God the whole time is saying, I want you to have the heart for this city that I do. I don't want you saying, you know what, I hope this city just goes to hell in a handbasket. He wants you to have his heart of compassion, his heart of mercy, his heart of grace, his heart of love for the city. Because so often the city, we see this in the Bible again and again and again, so often the city is a place where it can descend into darkness and God wants his people to be beacons of light in that dark place to win that city for God because God always intended not only to bless his people, to bless others, not only to bring his people to himself, but to use his people to bring others to himself as well. And he just kind of throws it at Jonah here and says, Jonah, you're more concerned about this plant than you are all of those people and their economy and their livestock and all these different things. But Jonah, I want you to have my heart. Jonah, I want you to see my heart for what it really is. I want you to be transformed as you get to know my heart. And Jonah again and again and again did not. And so the story ends. And we're like, dude, what did Jonah do? Like God's trying to get his attention. God's knocking at the door. What did Jonah do? But here's the beautiful thing. Part of the reason the book ends like this is so that you and I can make a decision. Because as we read this book, we can so often see that we are Jonah. That if God doesn't fit in our box, we're ticked at him. That we're more concerned with our own agenda than we are winning people for Jesus and sharing his love and his goodness with our family members, with our friends, with our coworkers in the city that he's called us to. And part of Jonah ending on a cliffhanger in and of itself is a message of grace as if God is saying, this is the tendency in us all. God is compassionate and good and gracious. He is good. And deep within our human hearts is the potential for evil. But that's not what we were created for. We were created good. We were created in God's image. We were created beautiful. And just because there is evil that, le- that looms in our heart, uh, the Bible says it's almost like a predator, like a, like, like, a, like a predatory cat ready to pounce on us. Even though sin and brokenness and evil is something that is waiting to pounce on us on any moment, God says, I have a better way for you. I have a way of compassion, a way of grace, a way where I can be your God, you can be my people, where I can move you back into the beauty that I created you for. And as Jonah ends on a cliffhanger, it provides you and the opportunity to say, you know what, God, I'm sorry for trying to put you in a box. Help me to be transformed by your goodness and let that goodness ooze out of me and be shown to others. So as we finish this book of Jonah, here's, here's a couple of big things that this chapter really gets us to tell us about God and tell us about ourselves. One of the first things it tells us is that we will always misrepresent God when we define goodness on our own terms. When we create a box for what goodness is, when we create a box for God, we define goodness and success on our own terms. But part of being a Jesus person, part of being influenced by God, means that we now define life based on him. That's something that we need to remember. And part of Jonah is is telling us to remember that. Remember that you're going to skew it if you're on your own. Let God define goodness because when we define it on our own terms, we misrepresent God himself. The other thing it tells us is that when God's people get off track, we're called to do three things. They're in succession. Turn back towards him. Be transformed by his goodness and share his goodness with everyone.
It's more about being transformed than it is making, more than it is um, doing the right things to be in God's good graces. When we get off track, as the people of God do, the first step is to turn toward him to say, God, I want to be transformed by you. I'm sorry that I've had this posture to you. I'm turning to you again and opening myself up to you. And as we do that, we position ourselves to be transformed by his goodness. And it is out of what we are that we share that goodness with others. That is what we're called to do. No matter how off track you are right now as a person of God or maybe as a Ninevite, someone who doesn't know God yet, God is calling you to turn towards him, be transformed by his goodness, and let that influence the world around you. As we finish up today, I want to share a poem with you. We've been uh, following this guy in our series named uh, Thomas Carlyle. He wrote a book of poems about the book of Jonah in uh, the 70s. And uh, this is his last poem in the book about Jonah. And it is so poignant and so beautiful. And I just want to share that with you for us to meditate on as we close today. It's called Coming Around. And it says, and Jonah stalked to his shaded seat and he waited for God to come around to his way of thinking. And God is still waiting for a host of Jonas in their comfortable houses to come around to his way of loving. As we continue our journey, may we be so transformed by God that we don't stalk in our comfortable houses, that we don't just slouch and slump in our comfortable houses, angry at God, waiting for God to fit in the box that we have for him. Let us instead be transformed by Jesus Christ. The one who could have sulked up in heaven, the one who could have griped and complained about how bad humanity is, but he didn't do that. He left the comfort of heaven and came down to earth where he was made fun of, where he was beaten, where he was tortured, where he was misunderstood again and again and again. That even though the people closest to him betrayed him, he didn't decide to sulk. No, no, no. Instead, he decided to go to a cross for you and for me. And on that cross, he paves a way for you and I to be brought into ultimate relationship with God and calls us to do the same with others. So maybe you're here today, and this is the posture you've had towards God. And today is the day that God wants you to leave your house of comfort, your house of anger, and finally come away to his way, come around to his way of loving and be transformed by his ultimate goodness. The invitation is there for you, whether you're a Christian whether you're not, no matter how messed up or how far you've turned, that's the invitation for you today. And I pray that you would say yes to it. Father God, as we come before you today, God, it's so easy for us to define you <laughs> by our own terms, so we think anyway. It's so easy for us to um, try to fit you into a box, God, but really you're so much bigger than that. Father, we pray today that you would destroy the God box we have in our head, that you would help us to see you as you really are, and as we see that, we would see that you're more beautiful than we ever could have imagined. Let us be transformed by you. Let us follow you, and wherever we are today, God, let us say no to our comfort of anger and looking at you the way we think you are, and instead say yes to the adventure of being transformed by your goodness and uh, allowing ourselves to be transformed by you as you really are. God, we love you. We give you everything that we are today, and it's in your holy and your precious name that we pray.